بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Um, so we will be having nine schools that will be competing in the speech competition um, for senior secondary schools in the names of Second, St. Augustine Senior Secondary School, Musrat Senior Secondary School, Masrud Senior Secondary School, St. Peter's Senior Secondary School, um, St. Joseph's Senior Secondary School, Mindau Senior Secondary, Greater Banjul Senior Secondary, Sheikh Hamdan, and the Kara Foundation. Um, each participant from each of these schools will be given five minutes to, to, to deliver a speech on the topics that we are giving to them. Um, once our judges are set, we would uh, invite, we would start with the participant, we would start with Senior Secondary, um, St. Augustine Senior Secondary, um, followed by Nusret Senior Secondary, Masrur would follow, St. Peter's would follow, St. Joseph's would follow, Mingdang would follow. Greater Banjod would follow, Iqra Foundation would follow, and then Sheikh Hamdan would come last. Ten. Okay, I'm just being informed that um, the participants each have ten minutes to, to, to deliver a speech, inshallah. Microphone to one of the judges, who will serve as the chief judge, to give an information regarding the criteria, um, what are they looking for, requirements for the speech competition, inshallah. Welcome you all to another um, session. Um, we already had the um, Quranic competition uh, in the morning, and now we are going for the speech competition at Cambodia. Um, so just to remind you, we were expecting 12 schools, 12 senior schools, but we have nine so far, but uh, if you know, three of the schools that are around should come, then let them please let us know so that we can put them in consideration. So we have nine schools so far. Now, uh, the way we are going to do this, um, each school is going to be given. From St. Augustine's will be giving his speech. <laughs> والصلاه والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين ومن تبعه بشان الى يوم الدين اما بعد عباد الله قائل لكم جميعا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين we thank Allah عز وجل the most merciful the most gracious the master of the day of judgment the absolute control of everything in the existence the nourisher the cherisher the provider the protector and the one of course who is absolutely controlling of everything that is into existence whether we know or not we send blessing and salutation to the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions and all those that follow their footsteps until the day of resurrection and may he make us among them uh, my topic as the chair have said it is going to be peace and its importance in islam but first of all we should know what is peace you know if we look into the worldly dictionaries of course they said peace Simply, especially in Oxford Dictionary, it says peace is free from the threat of war. That's what actually they mean. But in Islamic perspective, it's totally different. If we look just only the Arabic word Islam, which means peace in the English language, it's just literally meaning in the Arabic language, is totally different from what those Oxford Dictionaries are saying. But it simply means in the literal language of the Arabic that it is surrender and submission. But in Islamic perspective, the Islamic scholars have come with a unique definition of peace in which they said, Al-Islam is Islam lillahi bi tawheed wal inqiyadu lahu bi ta'at. That they've said that peace, which we said is surrender and submission in the Arabic language, is to surrender, conformance, and submission to Allah Azza wa Jalla according to the rules and regulations that he have ordered his prophets alayhi musalam to follow. That is monotheism, that is Islam, that is Tawheed. That is following the steps of the Prophet sallam, and all those that pass in the prophets, that is following Tawheed and staying away from shirk. And the second part of the definition that is well inqiyad lahu bi ta'ad, that is for you as a human being to submit your wills and your entire life to the obedience of Allah 
and rejecting all forms of kufr and rebellion. This is what they say the definition of peace. Allah, my brothers and sisters, uh, even if I just stopped here, we have completed our deen as Muslims. Because we've not the, the foundation of Islam is Tawheed. The moment we are not with Tawheed, we cannot call ourselves Muslims. And then peace is defined as Tawheed. So our condition of our Tawheed being correct is us having peace. With the light of this, the Prophet Muhammad have said, Al Muslim, man salim al Muslimuna milisani hi wayadi. That a Muslim is someone whom you know. The people, the Muslims, his fellow Muslims are safe from the evilness of his tongue and the evilness of his hands. This, of course, indicates that you cannot be a Muslim when you are violent to the rest of the humanity. You cannot be a Muslim who, at the end, you stop disturbing your neighbors and doing other things. That, of course, indicates you are not a Muslim. From today, if we leave this place, we see somebody violating people's rights, we should definitely tell him that you are not a Muslim. Because the Prophet ﷺ has said, Al Muslim man salim al Muslimun amil lisani hi wayadi. And we have a hadith, a hadith of Qudusi that comes in Imam Nawawi's book, which is uh, narrated by uh, Abu Sa'id al Wudri, where the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah Azza wa Jalla has said, Inni haram tu zulma ala nafsi wa ja'al tuhu bainakum muharraman fala tazalamu. That I have made oppression haram for me, forbidden for me as your Lord. And I have made it forbidden among yourselves, never oppress one another. Never oppress one another. So this indicates that what? Oppression, oppressing people's rights, violating people's rights is haram in Islam. And anything in, which is haram in Islam, if you do it, you aren't seen. If you do it, you aren't seen. With the light of this also, we have another evidence that where the hadith is narrated by Abu Umama radiallahu anhu that the Prophet Muhammad have said in Sahihul in Sunan Ibu Daud's book that the best of people in the sight of Allah are those that begins the greeting of peace are those that greet people with peace not saying hi, hello whatsoever but those that say assalamu alaikum that they pray peace for people and I saw the Allah anhu narrated in the book of Sahihul, uh, Sahihul Bukhari that uh, the Prophet have said that the worst of people in the sight of Allah are the quarrels of, are the people that they cause havoc and violence on the face of earth. They are the worst people in the sight of Allah. By just looking at this point, we see that Islam is all circled in the point of peace. That the moment we are not peaceful, we cannot count ourselves as Muslims. And even we have evidence in the Quran. In chapter 25 of the Quran, that is called Furqan, uh, verse 63, Allah Azza wa Jalla has said, Wa ibadu rahmani lazina yamsuna ala al ardi haunan, wa iza katabahumu al jahiluna, wa alu salama. They are those that you know, the servants of the most compassionate are the ones that they walk on the face of art with humility. And if the ignorance address them, they tell them, Salam, peace. We are not people of violence. We only know peace. Our religion is peace. We work on peace in order for us to be Muslims. So we don't have violence. They walk away. They are, the, they are called the servants of Allah. Azawajalla. And all of us, if we want to go to Jannah, we need to be servants of Allah. Azawajalla. And from today, we should put this in the back of our mind that if we want to be servants of Allah, Azawajalla, that we need to be peaceful. And even we have evidence that you cannot go to Jannah, we are not peaceful. Then this is narrated by Abu Hurairah He said the Prophet Muhammad sallam, have said in the book of Sayyid Muslim that you will not go to Jannah until you believe. And you will not believe until you love each other. And shall I tell you something? If you are to do it, you will love one another. And that is spread peace among yourselves. So my brothers and sisters, we've just seen by just these few hadiths that we cannot achieve nothing in Islam when we are not peaceful. So peace is the number one thing in Islam. Even if your tawhid will be correct in Islam, you need to be peaceful. You need to make sure that you have peace. You need to make sure that people are safe from your evilness. And we have a short story about that woman that the Prophet was told about, that this woman is somebody who you know, she has done a lot of deeds. She pray, she do the hajjud, she, she do so many things. But she has only one problem. And that problem is what? Is she violate the rights of her neighbors. And the Prophet ﷺ said, in the half in now, she's in hellfire, it's not like she will go to hellfire. So the condition of us, our deeds being saved until we go to Jannah with them is when we are peaceful. And Allah have said also in chapter 5, that is what Maida, 
verse 32 of the surah min ajli zalika katabna ala banu israil man qatala nafsan bi ghairi nafsin aw fasadin fil ard fa ka'anna ma qatala an-nas jami'a wa man ahyaha fa ka'anna ma ahya an-nas jami'a that we prescribe for open banu israil that if somebody kills an innocent soul or the person cause violence and uh, and the person cause violence on the face of earth that the person uh, do facade on the face of earth is as if the person have killed entire humanity can we imagine that you just disturbing people disturbing the creation of Allah is as if you have killed the entire creation so we have seen how peace is important and if you just could able to save one person from punishment or from having some harm on the face of earth is as if you have saved entire humanity. This is how valid peace is in Islam. This is how important peace is in Islam. My brothers and sisters, today I want us to put this at the back of our mind. We are Muslims when we are peaceful. The moment we are out of peace, we are no more Muslims. And we have so many evidence that peace is the most important part of Islam. We have a hadith where the Prophet Muhammad said that do you know something that is more important than charity, more important than zakat, and more important than prayer? The Prophet said, spread peace among yourselves. Okay, uh, I'm having just two minutes. Huh? Okay, so uh, the Prophet said, is for you what? For you to keep peace among yourselves because who are some and bad feelings destroy humankind so even the salad that we do even the charity that we give out and even the fasting that we are fasting right now the most important of this in islam is peace and these are pillars of islam am i right they are pillars of islam but peace is more important than them because the, because it is the fundamental thing of islam the moment you do not have it, you cannot have Islam. So I will conclude by saying, let's go home with this. Man salim al muslimuna min lisanihi. Al muslim man salim al muslimuna min lisanihi. Wa yadin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa akiru da'wa na alhamdulillah wa bil alameen. Thank you, football betting. Football betting centers can be seen everywhere in the Gambia. What are the effects of gambling and how can the Gambia avoid them? The question, the, the topic is, uh, what are the effects of gambling and how can the gambling happen? A'udhu billahi minas shaitanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Sallallahu wa sallam. Wa barik ala al-mabi'uthi rahmatan lil alameen. Nabiina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. ومن اهتدى بهديه وصلنا بسنته الى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته brothers and sisters i greet my honorable judges uh, audience and my fellow speakers i am honored to be given this great platform to discuss the topic effects of gambling and how to avoid it in Gambia. First, what is gambling? Gambling, it literally means game or playing games of chance with the hope of winning. Literally, this is what it means. You play game of chance with the hope of winning. Therefore, pertaining the word gambling and what it literally means it is banned, prohibited in Islam. Our religion prohibited all type of gambling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yes'alunak anil khamri wal maysa. They ask you concerning intoxicants and gambling. Maysir is an Arabic term referring to gambling. It is from the word Yusuf. It means ease. You get something out of no labor, no work. You get it free due to 
having or earning it unlawful. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Yes, Aluna ka anil mais, anil khamru wal maisar, kul fi hima ithmun khabirun wa manafi'un in nas, wa ithmu huma akbar min nafi hima. He says, Say, in them are great sin. Great sin. Ithmun khabir. It is the only phrase used. Ithmun khabir is only used for gambling and intoxicants. Look how Allah combined it here. Gambling, a great deed. Allah says, Ithmun khabir. But yet, it has some benefit for me. Oh, look, the great benefit. You become famous by playing gamble. You earn money without labor. You earn a lot of living fast with just little amount of time. But with all that, Allah says, Wa ithmuhuma akbaru min naf'ihima. Akbaru min naf'ihima. Their sin, their abomination is greater than their benefit. How? How comes? With all these things, I earn a lot of things, become famous, but still, Allah says, its sin is greater than the benefits of it. Why? Listen to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, innama al-khamr wal-maysar wal-ansab wal-azlam rijzun min amal al-shaytan fayitanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun. He says, this intoxicants, this gambling, and the stones used for sacrificing these altars, and then Islam, the divining arrows, they are all what? Abomination. Min amal is shaitan. From the work of shaitan. Allahu Akbar. Look, from what type of things did Allah Join gambling with riches, riches, abomination, a great abomination. Only for this is sufficient for it to be haram. But do you know why? With all this great benefit it has, two things overshadow all that benefits. Two things outweigh that benefit. And what is that? It affects your mind and your religion. Everything that affects the mind and the religion is totally prohibited. Last is Innama yuridu shaitan an yu'aqiya bainakum an yu'aqiya bainakum al-adawat wal-baghda fi al-khamil wal-maysa. Last is indeed shaitan wants to put animosity Enmity with you to put enmity between you people. Wal Baghda and hatred. Fil Khamr wal Maisa. So, these are the effects. Why Islam prohibited? One, the previous verse, Allah says, La Allakum Tuflihun, if you want to be successful. Meaning, if you indulge in it, you will not be successful. Right? Our Sheikh made mention here that Islam is about going forward, not backward. How do you go forward? Being succeed on what you know, what your aim is, your objectives. Therefore, in order to be successful, you will live avoid it. Then, if you indulge in it, you become not, you, you are not successful. That is one effect. Second. Hatred and, animo and animosity. Enmity between you. What does enmity and hatred lead to? Bloodshed. Killing one another. No helping. Jealousy. And all sorts of evils. Losses. But all those things deal with the mind and perhaps phys physically. The great thing that deals with your religion. The great thing that deals with your religion. وَيَصَدَّكُمْ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَعَنِ الصَّلَاةِ فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُنْتَهُونَ أَمْ تَحْنَا يَا رَبِّي Says, this, it avoids you, it refrains you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Allah. The Prophet says, the likeness of the one who remembers Allah and the likeness of the one who forgot about his Lord is like the dead and the living. Wallah, when you play gambling, it's like you are dead. It's one. It refrains you from the remembrance of Allah. And the biggest of it, is salah, and from prayer. You do not pray. You neglect, you neglect your obligatory acts. Because you are just in thinking of the gambling loss that you get and how to make profit out of it. Earning unlawful, unlawful earnings. So these are some of the effects that gambling can lead to. Now, uh, statisticians have given that this year, almost 30% of the world problems, 30% of the world crimes in America is as a result of gambling. More than 1,631 people died every year out of gambling. In another book of an Iranian, in our inhabitants, kill a victim. And then the, uh, this one, when the victim was brought, the case was brought, and then they asked the suspect, what happened? He says, this man, he took a lot of money from me through gambling. And then I asked him to play with me again. But he refused. So I ran after him and clean and killed him. He stabbed him three times and fall dead. Now look, Rijisun bin Amal is Shaitan. This is what Allah is trying to avoid you with. Now, how do you stop this gambling in the country? Rampant. Football issues, raising of everything. All these are gambling projects. How do you stop it? You can only stop a thing when you know how it is or what caused it. Three things. Ignorant, negligent, when the constitution negligent, and then perhaps lack of job or uh, unemployment. Therefore, and the issue of the government, they should give strict constitutions with strict rules pertaining gambling and all sort of gambling should be banned. All type of activities pertaining gambling should be stopped constitutionally with rigid rules in order to avoid it. Second, ignorance. It's like the youths are ignorant of what gambling means and its effects and its effects. Therefore, People should be enlightened. Time. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm so on that time is in, on enough, so I would like to stop here. Subhanallah, who has brought us from darkness into lightness and guide us into the right way of life. His family, his companion, the righteous, and all those that follow his path till the life day. I would like to acknowledge the presence of the judges. Timekeeper, honorable guests, respected and boastful audience, with the warmest of greeting that suit the soul, pleasant to the heart, and beautifully rewarded. As a salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Before going further, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Umi Cham, a representative of Masru Senior Secondary School. On the topic, people consider hijab as fashion. Islam defer, justify the statement. My brothers and sisters, before I go further, we need to understand what it means by hijab and fashion before we consider them as the same or not. Fashion is a lifestyle which is introduced in the society by few people and adopted by many as their way of appearance in the society, but does not have any guiding rules and regulations. Why hijab is an Islamic concept of modesty and privacy which has guiding rules and regulations. Even the Prophet wasallam, has mentioned it in the hadith of Trinity that hijab is modesty. Yes, hijab is modesty, but does not only involve our dressing styles as females and males, even males as well. We are told to be of high character, value, and so on. This modesty is supposed to calm us. It's supposed to bring us a sense of equality, a sense of peace. 
whether you are rich or poor, black or fair in complexion, Allah loves you, remember that. Let's just take the verse 59 in Surah to Hazar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya ayyuhal nabi yukulli aswajika wa banatika wa nisha'il mu'minin yudilina ilayhi min jalabi bi'inna. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Hey, yo, you need to be. Wa hal say sohna. Say dom. Ak molem juge ni julit. Nyum mur sen yara. The Quran also speaks of hijab in verse 30 to 31, chapter 24 of the Holy Quran. The first term hijab to be more than covering of your body. Hijab is a farata, an obligatory act that is introduced to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hijab involves our voice, the way we talk, the way we respond, the way we walk, our character, value, lowering of our gaze, everything with modesty. You don't blindly follow the society, fashion or whatever people think is pretty or fashionable that will expose your aura. Remember, you are a leader, not a flower of lifestyle. Nowadays, you will realize that women will put on a bayah, mashallah, and they will tie up their waist. All the physical part of their body is exposed, subhanallah. When you wear clothes, it needs to be in such a way that your entire body is covered. I mean, what is the essence of you covering your body when your entire body is... When, when, what is the essence of you wearing clothes when your entire body is not covered? What you will realize is that some will put on tight or loose trousers. And when you ask them, they will tell you that I am doing hijab, subhanallah. Others will cover up their heads. Well, part of their body is exposed for men to be distracted. Wallahi, fashion being fit now. My brothers and sisters, even the Prophet, even Aisha, Allah, Anha, has reported that the Prophet said, anybody who wants to bring something that is not in the, anybody who wants to perform a deed that is in accordance with our matter, it shall be rejected. My brothers and sisters, we cannot call a fried egg as a boiled egg, despite they are both eggs. Subhanallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. My brothers and sisters, nowadays people will only clothe in order to reveal all that is part of fashion, but it's not hijab because it is not in line with hijab. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has advised us in verse, in verse 26 in chapter 7 that if we want to achieve comfort, we need to dress in the most appropriate way. Don't be among those that want to reveal what Allah has concealed within their private part and they want to sew it up. Subhanallah. My brothers and sisters, hijab does not diminish our beauty, but instead, it increases our beauty beyond all beauties. Even the Prophet wasallam, my brother, then you want to be rewarded, say sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Even the Prophet has said it. The Prophet has caused those who you know that they don't dress well or they appear naked in this society. My brothers and sisters, I hope with this presentation of mine, it will not only have a positive impact on our lifestyle, but will also enable us to know the negative impact or the negative effect that fashion is imposing in our religious life of modesty. On that note, I thank you all for your wonderful kind attention. The next participants would be the representative of St. Peter's Senior Secondary School. St. Peter's Senior Secondary School. This topic is the school's early marriage in the Islamic perspective. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May I see the hands of the singles? Those who have not get married, may I see your hands? <laughs> okay, from today, listen to me. From today, every one of you should be ready to send proposals. All praise is due to Allah, blessing and salvation upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his companions, his household, and whoever followed their footsteps to the day of the coming. Brothers and sisters in Islam, before I start my talk, I will humbly send a special 
Greetings to the high table and all of my brothers and sisters who are down there to listen to me. I am Mama Sise, the representative of St. Peter's Technical Junior Senior Secondary School, and my topic of discussion is early marriage. But before starting or before going into my speech, I would like to enlighten you and brief you about the mood of my speech today. I will both rest on the definition of early marriage in the Islamic perspective and also in the Western perspective. I will both rest on the effects of early marriage and is early marriage allowed in Islam? These are the two areas that I am going to focus on. So kindly listen to me if you want to go home today and send proposal to anyone that you feel like you're interested. Is it important? Obviously. What is early marriage? From the Western perspective, early marriage is a marriage or a union between two people. Either one or both of them are under the age of 18 years. But the Islamist perspective is early marriage is a union between two people, either one or both of them are at their younger age. Now the difference here is that Western perspective talks about age, but Islam perspective, they didn't talk about what? Age. Talks about when you are in your, uh, your, your younger age. As far as the conditions of marriage is fulfilled. So brothers and sisters, we ask ourselves, is early marriage allowed in Islam? We have to refer ourselves to the Quran and that of the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says in the glorious Quran, chapter 65, verse 4, إِنْ اُرْتَبِتُمْ فَعِدَّتْهُنَّ ثَلَاثَةُ أَشْهُرُ وَاللَّا إِلَمْ يَحِذْ وَأُولَاتُ الْأَحْمَالِ أَجَلُهُنَّ أَنْ يَضَعْنَ أَمْلَهُنَّ وَمَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِ يُسْرًا In this verse, Allah is telling the women whom you know that they have doubts in their men's period or they have doubts in their idda. Allah said, tell them, tell them it is three months and even those who have not seen their men's. So the scholars refer this verse to be an, uh, um, an, a source or to be something that is supporting Ali Mari because it says even those who don't see their messages. So therefore, the younger ones are already given the rules or the settings of marriage in the Quran. And Allah also said in, in the Quran, in the glorious Quran, Allah says, chapter 4, verse 3, where in وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تُقْسِتُوا فِي الْيَتَامَ فَانْقِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ مَثْنَى وَسُلَاسَ وَرُبَعَ If you know that you will not be justice to the often girls, marry women of your choice in two, in three, and in four. The, interpre in the interpretation of this verse by our beloved mother Aisha when she was asked by her nephew, Allah revealed this verse to those whom you know that they are interested to get married to their orphan girls, but they treat them badly. Allah says they are forbidden to marry those, those orphan girls. But those who treat them goodly, they can get married to them because of their beauty, because of their property. So my point of view here, brothers and sisters, is that who is an orphan? Who is an orphan? An orphan is a person on the age Therefore, it is a verse supporting early marriage. We refer ourselves to the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or to the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which was reported by Abdullah in Al-Bukhari and Muslim. He says, Ya ma'ashara al-shabaab, man istata'a minkum al-baad, falyata zawwaj. Allahu Akbar. Prophet says, Oh, you the young man, if you can afford to get married, marry, then I'm telling you brothers and sisters today, you can afford to get married, then marry. <laughs> what are the good effects of early marriage? It preserves your chastity and it completes half of your iman at that younger age. 
The second thing is, if you want to have the love of Allah, Allah says what? Get married. So if you want to have the love of Allah at your, at your, your younger age, then get married early. We refer ourselves to the Quran. Allah says in chapter 30, verse 21, among his signs that he created from us wives so that we can be with them in tranquility. And he continues and say what? He Allah is going to sow his love and his mercy upon you. So if you want to get the mercy of Allah and the love of Allah at that at, a, at, an, at, at a younger age, brothers and sisters, we have to get married early. It is also part of the good effects of early marriage, protection of protection, the protection, it protects you from the sexual temptations. Today in our society, everywhere we are, especially in our schools, we mingle with the brothers and sisters, we mingle together. Now you see a girl that you are very interested. Oh brother, before you die with that temptation, get ready to get married. Talk to him, talk to her, go to, go to the parents, and you get married. If not that temptation, if not that temptation will result to something that you will not like. So therefore, if you want to make an end to that temptation, you have to get married. And the last effects or good effects of early marriage, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says, he is going to be very proud to see his ummah on the day of judgment to be the largest. Then one of the effects of early marriage is to have what many people or the Ummah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be increased. What are the bad effects of early marriage, brothers and sisters? When we talk about the bad, the bad effects of early marriage, we talk about things that you know that if early marriage is not done, they will come to destroy our society and they will come and, and demolish our society. What are those things? First of all, brothers and sisters, Zina. Zina will be rampant in the society. And what did Allah say in the Quran about Zina? Allah said in chapter 17, verse 32, وَلَا تَقْرَبُ الزِّنَا إِنَّهُ كَانَ فَاحِشَةً وَسَاءَ سَبِيلًا Allah said, do not be near to Zina because it is immoral. Because it is an evil way. Then if you want to make end to Zina, brothers and sisters, we have to get married out. The other good and bad effects of early marriage, brothers and sisters, it leads or increase the stress level of the youths. Today, many youths are stressed. They say they aren't going for work. They say they aren't going, they aren't ready to work. They are frustrated. Because of what? They are not married. Had it been, wallahi, when you go home, a wife will come and say, brother, where's the fish money? Will you have that time to stress? Obviously, you don't have that time to stress. You will be responsible. And that is going to teach you or show you something in your life. The last bad effects of early marriage, brothers and sisters, the last of it, it leads to mass failure in schools, especially in tertiary schools or in secondary schools. Because of the saying of the philosophers that a married man is an happy man. So if you want to be happy, if you want to have that comfort, if you want to have a stable mind, what should you do? You should get married so that you can pass your exam because it is going to, wallah, it is going to affect your brothers and sisters. Let's say in a class, I'm with a sister that I'm very interested. I like this sister. When she talks, it comes to. So therefore, we are going to end here and say, وَآخِرُ الدَّوْعَنَا أَنِ الْحَمْدِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ The next participant is coming from St. Joseph Senior Secondary School. Um, St. Joseph Senior Secondary. The participant will be talking about the topic, Islamic um, religious religious tolerance. What is the name of groups from Quran and Sunnah?
أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. We thank Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the Master, the King, the Sustainer, the Creator of the seven heavens and the earth, and we send peace and blessings, peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless his companions. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless each and every one of us present here. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, today our topic of discussion is religious tolerance. What is religious tolerance? First of all, many people have different ways of defining it. But we need to know that the most important thing is that religious tolerance simply means the freedom of religion. Does Islam encourages the freedom of religion? That is our topic today. The answer for that question is yes. Islam encourages freedom of religion. How does it encourage it? What are the evident evidences? We have to go and look at the Quranic point of view. But before going to that, let, let us go and look at the role of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, starting from Adam alayhi salam to the last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I have this question. When they were calling people towards Islam, did they force anyone to accept Islam? The answer is no, they didn't force anyone to accept Islam. And I have another question again. The prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they were calling people towards Islam, they, they should embrace Islam. Did they use sword or did they use any other instrument and be telling them that if you don't accept Islam, we are going to kill you? No, they did not force anyone to accept Islam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Ma'idah, verse 99, and for my messengers, their duty is just to deliver the message. They don't have the right to force anyone. They are just there to deliver the message. So once the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people of Mecca, they told him, Ya Muhammad, if you want us to stop worshipping these idols, then why is it that your God is not allowed, is not forcefully preventing us from worshipping these idols? Because you said that Islam is the true religion. So why is it that your God is not forcefully preventing us from worshipping these idols? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the following verses to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He told him, Ya Rasulullah, O Muhammad, this New, this excuse is not a new excuse. Why? Because the people before them have said the, the same excuse. So therefore, you are just there to deliver the message. This new excuse that they are telling you, it has been said by many people before them. So therefore, you are just there to deliver the message. And then in another surah, in another verse, Surah Ashura, verse 48, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told him, Ya Muhammad, if you call your people towards Islam and they turn, the, they turn their back, you call them towards Islam and they don't, they, they don't ex, um, embrace Islam, they turn their back, then do not be sad and do not feel sad. Why? Because you are just there to deliver the message. You are not sent as a guardian over them. You are just there to deliver the message. And in Surah Baqarah, verse 256, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the religion of Islam, is not forced on anyone. Therefore, we all have, we can, we can worship the religion that we want. Islam encourages you, it allows people to worship the religion that they want. Even though Islam is the true religion, it's the hack. But no, Islam said that you can worship the religion that you want if you don't want to embrace Islam, right? And then there was a mission that the Prophet ﷺ, he was calling the people of Mecca towards Islam. And then he, wrote, he read a very short surah to them. He told them, Kul ya ayyuhal kaafirun. Oh, you who do not believe, I will not worship what you worship, and you will not worship what I worship, and I will not be worshippers of what you worship, nor will you be worshippers of what I worship. Lakum dinukum wal yadin. With you is your religion, and for me is my religion. This story talks about the freedom of religion. Therefore, Islam encourages, it allows the freedom of religion. Even though Islam is the haq, but it allows you to, to, um, to worship other religions if you don't want to choose Islam. Therefore, let's all, we are all um, members of uh, Islam, and we are all Muslims. You might be, uh, you know, keeping people or trying to call people towards Islam, and they will cut on their back, but no, do not feel saddened that you are just there to deliver the message. Islam allows religion, uh, religious tolerance. Therefore, this is all I have for you, and I hope you all, uh, thank you all for your kind attention. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfirullah wa atu bi ilayk.
Um, the next participant will be coming from Mindal Senior Secondary School. Mindal Senior Secondary School. Um, he will be talking on the topic, uh, discussing the significance of our life in this life. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. We praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى. We thank Allah سبحانه وتعالى for for blessing us and for giving us this beautiful month of Ramadan. And as you know, the month of Ramadan it is the month of the Quran. It is the month where we study the Quran, we listen to it, we try to understand it, and we put it into practice and we convey it to others. Every deed that we engage in this month is multiplied. You and I know that. A farad act, the reward of it is multiplied. A sunnah act, the reward of it gets rise up to a farad, perhaps beyond, depending on your intention. My beloved brothers and sisters, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from among those who take this month seriously. As it is a gift, it may be the last Ramadan we are going to see in our life. And we, we have seen the Ramadans in past. We are lucky to see tonight. If Allah wants, we may not see tomorrow night. This is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is Ramadan and why it is so important in the Islamic faith? Ramadan is the ninth month of is, Ramadan is the holy month in the year of Islamic culture. For Muslims, it is a time for spiritual reflection and growth to help those in need and spend time with loved ones. And it is also a time when Muslims around the world fast during daylight hours for the whole month. Ramadan is the ninth month in the Muslims' lunar calendar. Muslims, Muslims observe this agreement of the, Ramad, of the Ramadan to mark when when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent an angel to Prophet Muhammad, usually done by all Muslims except those who are sick, pregnant, lactating, menstruating, elderly, or traveling. If you, if you miss fasting days, you can make up for them throughout the year. Allah says that the night of power is better than a thousand of moon. One thousand moon equal to 83 years and four months. Arabs felt that a person in his 80s become devoted and pious by worship all his life. But the worship during the night of power is better than the worship over 80 years. 80 years continuous submission to Allah. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala asked the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what shall I do if I happen to see this night of power? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to her, make this dua, Allahumma inna ka'afoon, tuhibbu al-afwa fa'afu anna. Oh Allah, you are indeed forgiving and you love to forgive. Please forgive us too. Please forgive us too. I pray that Allah guide us according to the Quran and the Sunnah and keep us in his right path and in his true part too. I mean, I thank you all for your kind attention. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Thank you. I would like to acknowledge the presence of the Vice President of Concern Citizens, Mr. Hussein Ali. Inshallah, he's amongst the world. Next, would be the participant from Prince Manuel Senior Secondary School. Prince Manuel Senior Secondary School. Hard um, topic is what are the rights of the parents and their children? What are the rights of the parents and their children? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is indeed a singular honor and profound gratitude to be granted this opportunity to present my school. I am Kadi Balajo, a student from Greater Banyu Senior Secondary School. My topic of discussion is the right of parents on their children. Firstly, 
Muslim children are considered as a precious gift from Almighty Allah. They are loved immensely by their parents and they become fondness of the family. But children should be aware of the rights and responsibility of their parents. Allah has mentioned in the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 233, Mothers may breastfeed their children two complete years for whoever wishes to complete the nursing period. And upon the father is the mother's provision, and they are clothing according to what is acceptable. It is the right of a parent to take care of his child. Yes. One responsibility of a parent is to make so the child is educated. Parents should make so the child is happy, honest, disciplined, and religious, and has knowledge in Islam, irrespective of the fact that they might be boys or girls. Parents who want their child to be religious, honest, and disciplined, they themselves should be religious, honest, and disciplined. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, be careful of your duty to Allah and be fair and just to the children. Parents should be fair to their children so that they can be fair with others around them. A father should not bestow more favor on some children than other without a valid reason. See, this kind of treatment will produce jealousy and hatred among siblings. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, be fair to your son. Do justice among your son. He repeated it twice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised us that he will never change a person condition until the person changes himself or herself. Parents should be respectful if they want their children to be respectful because a child does what he sees. One huge responsibility of a parent is to teach the child a good manner. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, a father cannot do anything to his child better than manners. It is the responsibility of a parent to teach the child how to greet people, how to sit, how to drink, and so on. It is the responsibility of a parent to circumcise a male child with his convenience. It is also a responsibility of a parent to provide good environment for their children so that they feel they are secure and loved. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, those who don't show respect to others, respect will never be shown to them. They should be taught how to treat people the same way they would like to be treated, and that is by having good manners and good habits. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like people with bad manners and bad habits. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, among the virtue and habits they should develop is the habit of being honest and thankfulness, helpful and considerate, which are being ludicrous on their behavior of others. And a habit of being clean, neat and tidy, so that they could look after themselves when they are older. Parents should send their children to modern madrasa with an interrogated curriculum which will give the child guidance to be a good Muslim. Yes. Parents have a big role to play. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect them. Parents should make so the child know how to read the Quran well and has a good knowledge in Islam. Yes. Children should develop the test of knowledge through by listening, observing, reading, and interaction with others. Children should teach their children to know how to read the Holy Quran and Hadith at an early age 
so that they develop the love and eat when they are older. They should talk them good moral, good character, good Islamic knowledge, and proper Islamic behavior. I thank you all for your kind attention. I'd like to call on the participants from Ipra Foundation channel. Ipra Foundation. Uh, so just for the participants, um, when you have one minute left, there's usually I notice I the Secretary General is very notified so that you have one more minute. So uh, it's not supposed to happen, but I think we're just having you so that we'll be able to summarize. So you can see the uh, sectors that are indicating this, it's telling you that you have one more minute to charge. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Bismillahi rahmanir rahim. After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of all creatures, master of the day of judgment, and the king of all kings, and sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inna alhamdulillahi na'maduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfir wa na'udhu billahi min sururi anfusina wa min shayyati a'malina. من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الحمد لله we thank Allah for this opportunity we thank Allah for this day and we thank Allah for this platform so today I'm going to give a speech on the importance of Sunnah I want you to pay keen attention to this. When I say the importance of Sunnah, it means there is a central thing that we are looking at. And this central person we are looking at is none other than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not just any man. He is our Rasul. He is our guidance. He is not just our guidance, but Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us whatever we are supposed to do in every matter of life. Sunnah is basically him to go to Jahannam and follow, you have to just follow the footsteps. That is what you are commanded to do. And also there's a part um, basically where people who do not follow Sunnah are like people who, who become the pupils of Satan. Being a pupil is basically like being pampered, being bad. Uh, I really want to commend every member organizing this program today. Alhamdulillah. It has been organized in the holy month of Ramadan. We all know that this is the month that the Holy Quran itself was revealed. When Allah says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadri. Wa ma adraka ma laylatul qadri. To the end of the, 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 the surah, Allah says, We have indeed revealed this message on the night of power. But when was this night of power? Allah says, Shahru Ramadan al-lazi unzila fihi al-Qur'an huda al-linnas wa bayinati min al-huda wal-furqan. During the month of Ramadan, period of the right, between right and wrong. So alhamdulillah, I really want to commend the participants for their efforts in learning the Qur'an. This month, as I always say, is World Quran Month. Every day of this month is World Quran Day. It is during this month that the holiest of books was revealed to the holiest of prophets in the holiest of lands by the holiest of angels, Jibril, from the Lord of the Walls, Tanzilun Min Rabbil Alameen. I really want to commend your parents who have supported you to acquire Quranic knowledge. This is the best of knowledge. As the Prophet himself said, Khairukum man ta'alam al-Quran wa allamahu, saying the best amongst you is the one who learns the Quran 
and then teaches it. This is the best of knowledge. These words are Allah's words. So for a Muslim to live his or her life without acquiring the knowledge of the Quran, subhanAllah, is a great mistake for us. I want to thank you all very much and pray that this will not be the end of our Quranic um, competitions. We will continue to organize such competitions. May Allah reward you all for your work. With that, I say, Salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.